You're listening to RTI Audio, powered by Rocky Top Insider. This is Pancakes and Bacon with VFL, Tyler Kerbison, and Reed Bacon. Hello, Vol Nation. Welcome to another episode of Pancakes and Bacon. I'm your host, as always, Kyler Curveson. Join us, Reed Bacon. Have another fantastic episode today. Uh, we are talking the NFL Combine, our guys that uh, showed out over there, um, and everything that has to do with them and their draft stock and what they're looking like and what they did at the Combine to help them out. So we're talking through all that stuff. We're also talking basketballs. We're talking the boys. Going into March, it is officially March, getting into SEC tournament play, getting into March Madness, what it's going to look like, how excited we are over the past two games versus Auburn-Bama, and looking ahead to South Carolina. So, bunch of stuff to get into before we get into all of that. Reed, how are you doing, bud? Kyler, you, you beautiful man. Uh I'm doing better. Uh, I think good. Thank goodness on Sunday when we talked, we did not agree to do Sunday or Monday because, and I did not tell you this when we were just talking because I wanted to get your, have your reaction as like everyone else, but your boy went to mass on Sunday, uh, went to brunch, came home, took a nap before I was going to go play golf with my dad. And so everything's rolling wrong smooth, just a nice, good Sunday. And I wake up from my nap, got a little, Got a little fill in the belly area. I'm like, it's a little weird. It wasn't anything terrible, but I was like, hopefully it'll go away. So I wake up, yeah. get some water in me, get some yogurt down, uh, head over to the week course. I love playing the week course. I've said it a m- bunch of times. It's one of my favorite places to play when I start getting back into golf so I can work on my irons. Mm-hmm. And uh, so – I go over there and my stomach just keeps like getting a little bit worse, a little bit worse, not feeling better. I'm like, eh, it's not good. But then I'm like, we're like on the 17th hall. I was like, dad, we got to go. I was like, your boy's got to make a bathroom break. So we get up to the clubhouse. Shocker. The week course has pretty nice bathrooms. Now. Okay. I did walk into the guys and it was decent. And I said, I'm going to the girls. So it's a, So it was a one staller. And I was like, what's the likelihood that a female is going to need to come in here while I'm in here? Read the fact that you're just like, I know I have an issue coming and this is not going to be pretty. And you're like, yeah, I'll go to the women's. I I had to do what was more clean for me. (laughs) And and that's even with wiping the seat off, laying the paper towels down or the uh, tissue paper. Um, I'm talking about leaving it for the next for the next lady who walks in. Dude, it was like it was five thirty or six. It's fine. No one else was going to be there. So anyway, I go in there, and it wasn't a massive to do. I mean, it was decent. But uh, then I get home, and I'm just like feeling worse and worse. And I come home, I shower, I try to hit some Pepto Bismol, and then you realize it, and you're like, I'm in for it. Like this is a full blown virus i'm getting sick yeah yeah you know what's up and the weird thing is kyler for three marches three marches in a row i can tell you the dates on on three marches in a row i've had a stomach bug or food issues or whatever and i'm like what what's going on here with with march but three marches in a row same type deal so my mom has actually just gotten over covid she had it for about a week and a couple days when I had COVID back in October, it kind of started with the stomach stuff and then it would last for a week and it would change and be different. So, so I was like, maybe I'm getting that. Yeah. You know, I don't know what's up. So then it's literally that rotation at night where it's, you try to lay down in bed, ain't happening. So then you go uh, to the floor in the bathroom <laughs> And you just, you're just, you're just there and you're like, you're, you're, you're in a whole nother world. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you're, you're, you're out of it. Your brain is not in Knoxville, Tennessee. Like it is not in the home. <laughs> it's, it's in a different place. You're in a wholly different. I know I'm in my bedroom. I know I'm in my bathroom, but it's like, I'm, I'm gone. Yeah. And so you're just fighting the battle. Then you go to the toilet. 
And then, so it's just all night of this stuff. Thank goodness. Uh, I woke up the next day and was just really, really tired, really exhausted, uh, was able to sleep, took some, took some time off work, felt decent enough later in the day to do some work, take Annie on a small short walk just to get out of the house. And I do feel a little bit better now. I don't, I don't know about you, but like, do you ever get, and I would love any comments, uh, from anybody, but do you ever get that like fog or cloudy or brain fog when you're sick? Definitely. Yeah, okay. for sure. I, uh, the last time, the last time I was sick was actually like beginning of January. I think I got it from my Brienne, my wife, cause she got sick randomly right at the end of December after we got back home from visiting family. And she was like throwing up for multiple days sick. Yeah. And then it was like a week later, I woke up and was like, mm, I do not feel well, like in my stomach, but it was just kind of like, you might be all right. Maybe you just need to like go to the bathroom once, like no big deal. But I woke up, went to go work out. I'm literally doing my warm up, my like upper body warm up, getting ready. I drop down, do 20 push ups, stand up and immediately go, oh no this is not good and have to run to the bathroom in the gym and just all just projectile right in the toilet. It was oh. wild. Like it hit me like, yes, I had the feeling, but I was like, you're going to be okay. Like you can push through this. And then I did like just a little bit of movement in those 20 push ups, And it was like, no, you're, you're not good. And I'm, I'm sitting over there like into the toilet. And then I'm like, okay, I am going home. I'm not doing like, and I, I think I threw up like maybe two more times that day. And I don't know what it was, but it just hit me. But for sure that entire day, I couldn't think of anything. Like I was out. Down yeah, are you just like, are you just in a bad head space and you're just like laying around the house? Yeah. That like that that really is where it is because like sometimes you start to think like oh maybe I can do something and your brain just like does not compute like no. it does not get there and it just it just fogs up and then you're like wait what was I thinking about? It's super trippy too because like I've talked on here about like my mental health and stuff and whenever I used to have like real bad anxiety or even when I was going through uh, my stage of depression I felt like and people who have mental health know that like sometimes you feel like you're in that cloud and in that fog, you feel, mm -hmm. you feel fine. Like you're not sick, but your mental's bothering you. Yeah. So that kind of trips me out sometimes. Cause I'm like, is this going to go away when I feel better? Mm -hmm. Is this some of my mental mm -hmm. health? So that, that doesn't help, but it's something I've never really talked to about other people, but like I've started talking to people and I'm like, Hey, when you feel sick or you're like, you're kind of out of it. Right. And they're all like, yeah, oh, for sure. So that, that makes me feel better. But I'll say this, like, Though I would, I first off, I'm a huge baby when I'm sick. Being sick sucks. Like it does. <laughs> yeah, it, does. It, it, it it stinks. There's there's every nothing about it is it, it's it's awful. Yeah. But I would rather have anything than stomach virus or for stomach a virus because I hate throwing up. I hate getting. I sick. do too. I it, I fight it. Like I fight mm -hmm. it, and that's probably not a good thing. Um, and by the way, if I am ever going to do it, I'm not going in the toilet. I have to go to the bathtub because the toilet feels so gross to me. Uh, so I have, to, yeah, I get it. Yeah. So I have to do it like in a bathtub and just clean it out that way. But that's the one thing I fight off. And so you're just like, and you just know you're in it. You're just like, bro, like good thing time flies because I'm about to be in it for the next 24, 48 hours. But yeah, luckily I, I, I feel better. And it's just like, I feel like so many people I've talked to lately, whether it's work or personal or whatever, it's like everybody's just going through it right now uh, yeah. with, di with I, different with different stuff. Now, obviously, it's a little bit more severe, but I remember when I first got COVID, I was literally teaching myself how to use Adobe. It was before the podcast started and I was taking I was literally like watching YouTube video, like three hour long YouTube videos that were about how to use Photoshop, how to use video editor. And I'm just, I have it pulled up on my computer and I'm doing it, watching a video, doing it, watching it. And I was doing that for like a couple of days. And then 
it got it was so weird it got to like one two o'clock one afternoon i'm still work i'm like looking at the computer working on it and all of a sudden i was just like like started blinking a lot and i was like yeah i cannot pay attention like yeah. i cannot concentrate and that never happens to me like i'm like i'm very able to just be like all right here i go and just lock in on something and what do you know i start getting shivers I start sweating. I start like it just it just hit me like a ton of bricks. But I I remember that. I will always remember that because I was like, bro, I literally cannot look at this screen anymore. It's trippy, isn't it? It's so weird. Yeah, it is. I so the first time I had COVID, I was living by myself. Logan had just moved out of my house. And so, like, me being by myself, secluded, was not ideal. No. Uh I, your boy was not handling it well mentally. But then when I got it this past time in October. I handled it much better. I just was really, really, really tired, really exhausted. Um, and I didn't even know that I had it for sure. So I was still like trying to do like some workouts and stuff. And like, I could just get through my back therapy stuff and was shot and finally realized like, okay, you're officially sick. And it's like some days with COVID though, it was so weird. Cause some days you wake up and you're like, am I getting better? Then the next day's awful. Mm -hmm. Then it's like, it's just this. And then the symptom, the symptoms changing was wild. But anyways, I don't mean to hijack it, but I was like, I got to ask Kyler this. And I hope we'll, we'll get some comments, but I'm excited to hear what other people say. If they kind of have that brain fog too. Cause it's just like the best way I can explain it is like, you know what you're doing and you know where you are and what's going on, but it just feels like a hair different. If that makes yeah, sense. It really does. So, um, no, I think everybody experiences that. I don't think you're, I don't think you're odd. <laughs> don't worry yeah i think you're odd for other stuff don't yeah facts. not that facts. well how, how, have you been? how have you okay. been okay well let's jump into it let's jump yeah. into it um so we're talking combine first had a few guys over there uh i know i just want to start with this i know that guys are going to try and be strategic about what they do at the combine and i do get it to some degree, there's a part of me that goes, what's the, like, just, just do it, man. Like, do you really think a month is going to be like a crazy difference? And if it is, you test on your pro day too. And they see, right. I, I don't like, I don't get like the Caleb Williams literally not doing a thing. Like, did not do it like did not do an event did not do like medical stuff like literally didn't get blood drawn didn't do an ekg didn't do any of that stuff I, it just seemed very like like i'm better than this kind of I, I i don't know like is that do you feel that vibe when you see guys who are just like no i'll just do it later in my pro day uh, I know people have talked about that because I've listened to some, this is the time of year where I'm cranking up more podcasts, uh, compared to just doing ours. And then I had one NFL, well, like one and a half NFL ones I listened to. So I've mm -hmm. listened to some good amounts and people breaking stuff down. I, it doesn't bother me personally. Um, life is the way of like, if you're really good and you can get away with not doing stuff like Marvin Harrison Jr. didn't do a, uh, anything. Mm -hmm. Um, so that stuff doesn't, it doesn't bother me. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. You like feel that like the person is legit just, Hey, I don't want to do stuff right now. Are they, Hey, I don't need to do stuff. Well, the Caleb Williams thing, I, the people that I heard talking about were saying that he didn't want to go through and doing a bunch of stuff for teams that aren't going to have a chance at drafting him. And that he said, he would do his medicals for them specifically if he goes on team meets or different invites or whatever. Uh, I can't remember. And this was a cool, this was a cool twist on it. Um, it was, I believe it was Ryan Rosillo's podcast and he had one of the like national columnists mm -hmm. that does the NFL, maybe been like Albert Breer or one of these guys. And they brought him on and Marvin Harrison didn't do combine training. He didn't like hire an agent. He didn't travel somewhere to do all this testing. And he said, you know, it was basically around this whole vibe of I'm not, 
I'm not practicing for the Olympics. I'm not practicing for the combine. I want to stay in Marvin Harrison saying I'm staying at Ohio state and working out for football. And mm. Albert Breer was telling this story or it, it was Albert Breer or someone, a national columnist that does the NFL. And he was telling the story about how he went to a training camp one time and it was the first round draft pick offensive lineman for the team that he was going to watch. And the guy just like speaking of yakking, couldn't make it, couldn't make it through practice. He's over there yakking and coming in and out of shape and all this type stuff. And this is for not the stuff in August. This is stuff you're like, yeah, you, in you, uh, May, May, which is what you did. So this is right after the, the draft and the combine, yeah. well, the combine and the draft and stuff. And all these guys are working out for Olympic style stuff for running different stuff. And, and so he was talking about Marvin Harrison's like, yo, I'm going to continue working out for football because that's what I'm going to do. So when I get drafted, I'll be ready to go in. So that was a unique take to it. I don't know how much of that is BS and he just didn't want to do stuff or, and like I said, Marvin Harrison can do what he wants. He doesn't need an agent. He doesn't have that's to. True. And I, I, you know, I'm with him. I think a lot of, I think a lot of teams and a lot of people put a, a lot of weight in combine numbers. And I'm like, what are we doing here? Like, why is JJ McCarthy being talked about as like a top three quarterback right now? It's like, dude, I know he won a national, but like the guy's not do Michael Penix Jr., Jaden Daniels, Caleb Williams, like those Sam Hartman, even, like those guys, like JJ McCarthy is a late first rounder, a second round quarterback, but it's like guy gets at the combine, does a couple things good, and it, like their draft stock fluctuates day to day. That's why it's wild. That's why like going, they don't play another snap of football, but their draft stock goes up or down. Yeah, that's why I had a little bit, you know, I'm not on social media right now for because of lint, but I still will go to Rocky Top Insiders page and look at some stuff specifically that the articles that Ryan and Rick are uh yeah. Jack might do. And so of course I saw the clips of Joe Milton just launching it. And I'm launching. shocker. Like we all knew yeah, big surprise. Big surprise. The guy has a cannon. Like no, no, no one's doubting that. But I just did a little bit of an old eye roll because like you said, it's let's just watch the tape. Let's meet with them, see different stuff. Now I do think it can help people because did I think Jalen Wright was like I knew he was fast. I thought he was you know, you know, I thought he was low four fours, but go do a four three eight. That helps your stock too. It's true. The, the the tweet that Rick put out talking about how he was the fastest at the combine over Devon A Chain and and Jameer Gibbs, who a A Chain slash A Chan had a great year with the Dolphins. Jameer Gibbs was the first one taken, I guess, or the second one taken behind Bijan Robinson. So it's like that is cool. And I was listening to Chris Long's Greenlight podcast, and he had Mike Mayock on, which mm. I love listening to Mike Mayock and getting his perspective as the old GM. Plus, he did the combine stuff. Yeah. And it was really cool. I actually was listening to it last night, and they were talking about all the GPS stuff, how these guys are wearing the GPS trackers to show the miles per hours, and they even are looking at those more than the actual 40. Yeah. And he was using an example about how Keenan – Keenan Coleman, I think is his name, the guy, the big boy from Florida State, goes out and runs like a 4'6", doesn't look good in the 40. But then they do his GPS on the uh, gauntlet drill where the yeah. receivers run, catch, drop, run, catch, drop. And he said, but he had the fastest time in that. And he goes, well, let's go back last year. A guy that everyone knows now, Puka Nakua, did not run a great 40, but he had the fastest time in the gauntlet. And so there's like different ways to transition it into as much football stuff as you can. So I think I think that stuff is fascinating. To tie it all in, before we talk about the UT guys specifically, though, to tie it all in, it doesn't bother me if guys do it and don't do it. I yeah. I, I, I could really, you know, care less. Um, it would be different probably if I was a GM or in that spot. I may have an opinion one way or the other. But, yeah. They, I, don't I mean, know. heck, they may start putting in drills that are more – of what you would want to see. I, if I'm a GM, if I'm a NFL scout, if I'm a whatever, I want to see the miles per hour and the agility of the guy running the gauntlet. than I do his 40. Absolutely. A wide receiver, a running back, a DB, especially none of you are ever running out of that stance ever. You're never putting your hand on the ground and running like what, like what is that? 
right? It's testing your explosiveness, like getting out of there, and then like your top end speed. I get, but like I get your explosive tests in your vert and in your broad. I don't need to know your 10 yard split for explosion. I'd rather you line up in your wide receiver stance and see how fast you can get to 50 yards downfield in a streak. Sure. Right. Like make it position Pacific. Why in the hell are offensive linemen running 40 yards downfield? And who cares how fast they can run 40 yards? Like, I think some of that stuff is kind of impressive, though, when you see how big someone is. Oh, it's insane. It's yeah. insane. You see some of those guys moving. But I'm just saying, like, give Football me an play. O-line drill that's coming out of a stance and how fast can you get to 10 yards because that's where the linebacker is going to be at. Yeah, well, that's why they do talk about the 10-yard splits for O-line, D-line, and edge rushers. But I, I – so I was watching it working from home and not being out making stops – uh, or visits or having any meetings. I got to watch a little bit of it. Luckily, I did see Jalen run, look look beautiful, and we'll talk about him. But then I, they were doing the pass-catching stuff out of the backfield, and I Jalen was not going. And I was like, I was like, is that because his agent told him not to or what's the case? But then I read about it that, uh, on Rucked Up Insider that he was coming off a thumb injury. Mm. And so that was maybe one of the reasons he wasn't. So I think the best answer is each individual is using it that it's the best for them and that's what they yeah. should so jalen wright's going to go and show off that he's explosive and fast and maybe not show that he's maybe not the best catching it out of the backfield or whatever that's fine kamal Hatton didn't run but kamal had i did get to see some of his and he looked very fluid very Smooth. natural in in his drills and at, at db um i didn't watch anything of joe i didn't see anything of that and that wasn't for any specific reasons, just I it wasn't on while I was sitting there doing work. But no, I Joe just did a vert and abroad. That's it, and then yeah. his quarterback throwing. So that, okay, exactly. So that's what the combine has come to is if you need it, you're going to use it. You know, guys that are really trying to make it, they're going to go out and try to impress and and do mm. stuff. Uh, but I th- I do think it's neat that they're starting to use the GPS and different stuff that they can I track like in those in those more football style drills. Now, Jalen Wright, I. I think Jalen Wright's a, a, a really good player. I, I, I do. I think uh, I think me personally watching him this year, maybe I didn't appreciate him as much as I, I should have. Not that mm. I said I thought that he was bad. Um, like I said, I always thought he was good. Uh, I, I went back and I tried to watch highlights. I'm like, oh, yeah, I kind of forgot about that stuff. I, 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 think, I, get, I get what you're saying. I, I, I think, remember I – think- I think to put it in, I think the best way I can wrap it in a bow is to say he's good, and I know he's good. I think some UT fans thought he was incredible, and I never thought he was incredible. Yeah, because I, I remember you being like, when we get that blue chip running back. And, and a lot of people would say, Reed, what's more blue chip than you want? That the yards he put up, the, the well, how well our team did rushing, some of the big plays that he had, and then he goes to the combine. Now people are talking about that he could potentially be the first running back off the board. I'll I'll believe it when I see it. Not yeah. to say it couldn't be. I still think it's crazy, which I love. Uh, I enjoy and and like when Kevin Simon's on the Sports Animal, and I'll catch him when I can. Uh, I still think it's asinine, and I would tell him if we saw him. Uh, and that's because you and I have known him from uh, from from different stuff. But I would he proclaimed on radio and I called you the day he said it that he said that he thought Jalen Wright would be a first round draft pick in the top 20 and I was mm. flabbergasted do you remember when I called you when yeah when he, I remember yeah. and and so maybe he could be for a late first round or now I I don't know I mean maybe I'm wrong Kevin Simon did it that was his career for a, yeah, long he was time a scout there. for a while for a while right so you know obviously he's more knowledgeable than I am about it but I I can still have an opinion and say that I would be surprised but he he really really helped himself, and the one thing about Jalen is, I think that he is a really really good fit for some certain teams. That one while UT used him, and give him a lot of credit that he did a lot of personal stuff where he'd make one guy miss uh, in the backfield or whatever. I think the 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 run scheme that we had i thought our offensive line actually did pretty darn well for him but it was get at that handoff that one step cut 
and and take off, and he runs that well. So I could see him going somewhere that uses him well like that, mm-hmm. and he could be he could be a very good meaning. He's going to go. He's going to have a couple really good games in the NFL, be around for a couple years, and then kind of phase out. And that's not knocking him. That's just you have to be basically a Hall of Fame or All Pro running back to last. I mean, you really, really do. I mean, you're right. Saquon Barkley was a top five draft pick a few years ago, and now the dude's going to be he's a free going. Agent. What's that? He's a free agent now. Right, exactly. So you have to be a Derrick Henry future Hall of Famer to make it eight, nine years with one place to make it to that second contract. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, heck, look at uh, Todd Gurley. Oh, craziness. I, I just, like, that guy was destroying people in college. I mean – was ridiculous. He he was messing everything up. He was and, great too for a couple of years. Yeah, and then in the NFL, and then it's just like, hey, your 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 life as a running back it just wears on you. You can't you can't do it that long. No, it's it's a it's a crazy crazy thing. I mean, I was actually watching some of the running backs in the on the combine doing some of those drills, which was funny because a lot of these guys, it was, so, it was so funny to see all their same body types, all the anywhere from five nine to five eleven. 210 pounds they all look great rocked up muscle bodies but i'm just sitting there thinking i was like dang man like go like if you if i was you guys and you could have you should have gone and played corner linebacker because because really that's what it is they're going to get drafted and you have to be special 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 to make it to a legit second contract i mean you might go and make one uh that's like a halfway decent second contract but you have to be a guy that can also do it all, like an AK or like a Christian McCaffrey. I would say, can you hear me? It looks like you're frozen. Yep. I would say Derrick Henry is one of one, meaning that Derrick Henry's not very good at out of the backfield. He's just not. He's not a good pass catcher. It's not his thing. He he does decently well when we hit him up with some screens, but he's one of one that is like a true hand the ball off and can be special. All the other guys – that need to make it around the league for a while, you better be able to do it all. I don't know if Jalen will be able to do it all, but he'll be good for, for, for a first little bit, especially if he goes into one of those places that it's a quick hitter, hand it one cut and go. Cause yeah, you can't teach speed. And the other thing that that kid has, which I've always really, really respected is we've always said he runs super, super hard mm-hmm. and he makes at least one or two guys miss a tackle almost every play, any big play he has, there's one or two guys bust like just yeah, falling off, flying of off of him. Yeah, and he doesn't have to change his like his pace really. It's it's impressive. So he's 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 good. I thought Tennessee fans, in my opinion, some thought that he was like blue chip, blue chip, mm-hmm. and maybe my my vision of the blue chip is literally the I can do it all. Yeah, I think I think Jalen really. I mean, running at four three eight very much helped him. Uh, I think that showed his speed, even though he had long runs this year that showed off his football speed. Um, and then, I mean, just the overall growth in Jalen Wright since his first playing snaps at Tennessee to his last is great. Like he did a very good job growing into the running back. He is now. And, when NFL scouts and teams see that, they go, all right, like this guy worked to get where he is. He's going to continue working to get better. And we want those kind of guys in our building. So I love this for Jalen. I was very excited to see that he ran that fast because I want him to succeed, right? right. I want him to have success. And it did very much feel like Jalen is – going to be considered a middle of the pack kind of running back. Um, Tennessee wasn't in the playoffs. Tennessee wasn't in the championship. Tennessee wasn't necessarily one of the powerhouse teams that everybody was talking about. So it was like, even though we had good rushing numbers, sometimes if you're not as good of a team, they're not really, you know, your name's not at the top. You run a 4-3-8, that puts your name up there. They can't ignore you anymore. Especially he's got he's got pretty good size. Like he's not a yeah. he's not a hundred and 
70 pounder. I mean, he looks great. He looks rocked up and he, he runs hard too. But I think it's a great point that you make from the product he was to what he became. Uh, kudos to him. Cause yeah, you and I, have, you and I, have, yeah, you and I have seen a lot of people come into organizations and they don't change and, and you know why. And mm -hmm. so it's cool to see that. Uh, that's why I always, you know, kind of, not necessarily sway way into basketball, but I always thought Josh Richardson's story was so dope. Dude came in as a freshman, averaging two points a game, leaves at what he was. So it's it's always cool when you see and in football, a lot of times these individuals that are that are pretty high draft picks, first, second, third rounds, they're they're probably was were a pretty big recruit at some point too. Yeah. You know what I mean? So um for so sure they 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 you know when you are a big recruit sometimes it's like oh yeah you got it figured out oh to, to finish about the other guys uh, i don't know if joe will get drafted it won't surprise me if he does because i was just like my point was going to be this is a heavy quarterback class like that sucks for joe he's still going to get an opportunity whether he's drafted yeah. whether he's drafted fifth round or uh free agency He's still going to get a chance. Uh, you know, I knew it was uh, – speaking of listening to other podcasts, I, I was like, I know it's a bad omen when – pardon my take – is uh, talking about Joe is like, listen, this guy needs to be director first overall. Have you seen these throws? <laughs> like, Oh, just joking? <laughs> yeah, they're like they, – they, they like pointed out. They're like, look at him. Look at him. He's massive. And then like, look at this throw. And then they even like – tested the speed of everybody's throw against like a Matt and Joe won at that too. They're like, he's a freak. Like, of course he should. Are the bears going to draft him? Like they just start talking about it. I'm like, Oh God, that's not a good sign. Like, you know, that if added coming out of the combine, they're like, Oh yeah, Joe, these dump, these dummies and their best, they're the best sports podcast out there, but yeah, they but make their money being idiots. And I love it. That's them just being them, though. Exactly. And I was like, that's a bad sign for Joe. <laughs> like, that means he's not the serious pick. Yeah. Yeah, he'll get a chance. It'll see what happens. Um, I think I think Kamal, I've, you know, I've always really liked Kamal. I hate that he had two bad plays that stick out for a lot of Tennessee uh, fans. But yeah. uh, once again, I was listening to the radio and – I remember them talking about – I need to call in to Sports Animal. I need to call in. But they were uh, just – because they were talking about Kamal and losing Gabe Judy Alley. And they were talking about next year that they think the corners are going to be better. And I said, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> I, said, I said, those guys are some younger guys. I said, Gabe Gabe had some moments, and he, he wasn't, wasn't bad. And then Kamal had some really nice moments where he got injured – and so be, be careful, just kind of like when they were talking about, well, we'll be better at linebacker when they lost Jeremy Banks. And I was like, well, we weren't better at linebacker. And I tried to tell you all that, like, yeah. hey, be careful. But they were talking about, I do agree with them that they'll Kamal will be a guy that's going to last five, six years, seven years in the league. Because uh, I, I do think he's good enough. I think he'll be a, a solid rotation or, or, or whatever. And so I think he'll – I think ju just because he's a good player, but the nature of the position, he's going to have the, the best career out of these three, which is not a long I, I'm excited to see it because Kamal, before this past season, I didn't have any faith in at all. Like I was like, he's a fine corner, and sometimes he can make plays. But it was very much like, I don't know if I can trust him. There's a lot of times where it pans over after a big throw, and I just see a completion you know, on the other end of my screen. And it's kind of hard to be like, hey, yeah, I trust this guy in a big moment. But this year, like, he he turned around my thought process on him. When I saw him make some of the breakups he made this year, some of the defensive, like, plays he made on a ball in the air, that part, I was like, oh, I didn't see this before. This wasn't part of your repertoire before. You added this to your game. You un you came to understand a wide receiver's timing and his catch. You came to understand where that ball is going to be and how to high point it. Like those kinds of things makes me feel he could be an Elante Taylor kind of story. 
where Alante is like, good. We like Alante. He can make plays. There's also times where I see guys running past him. And it was, hey, how? what is he going to be like when he gets to the NFL? What do you know? He's a freaking starter for the Saints, and he plays really well for him. Okay, fantastic. Like, love to see it for the guy. Love to see it for Tennessee fans. Um, but I, I, I agree with you. Like, I think Kamal can be one of those for sure. Yeah, Alante had his – he's good size, good athletic. Uh, skill. I was still surprised that he went that early, but yeah, he's been, he's been, he's done well for himself and I'm happy to see that. I even tried to tell you early, like super early on, there were things I saw with come on. I said, dude, like this guy's man-to-man coverage, he, how smooth he was in and out of breaks. Like he was hip pocket. He just didn't do it consistently. And then yeah, obviously the play against Florida where he tackle, no tackle is brutal and etched in people's. Then the year that you and I went to the Florida game when it's home and he's not making tackles, you trying to rip the ball out when he shouldn't, and then Pearsall or someone else gets another 10 to 15 yards. Like those those are brutal plays. Mm-hmm. But if you watched him a lot of the times, and there was other times I think fans got upset with him that th- we were sitting in zones and it just happened. It wasn't necessarily his fault, but it probably didn't look good on TV. Yeah. But I, a lot of the times I thought that he played pretty darn solid. I, I really did. And so it was kind of nice when some of the pro football focus started coming out and talking about, Hey, like what he's not giving up when they're throwing at him and things like that. And then he got injured. But I personally always thought that he was pretty good. It was just maybe what you talk about sometimes is that consistency. And once I see this, then that's what I expect, but Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe coming and (laughs) maybe coming from the defensive backfield. And I say that very lightly, but (laughs) I know, I know how difficult it is. It's, yeah. it's so difficult. So maybe I'm a little bit leanier than the next Joe Blow watching on TV. Like, well, oh, how are you doing? You can't guard nobody. It's like, hey, like, <laughs> pump, pump the brakes. You know? Yeah, everyone thinks uh, DB is like the easiest position when it probably is the hardest on the field. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, anyways, uh, but yeah, good, good, good job, good job for them. I don't know who's going to do stuff. At, at the pro day and if they'll run and do different stuff. So it'll be interesting to see, but let's talk basketball. I'm very excited that you have now tuned in and started watching because you picked a great yeah. to start watching. So what were your thoughts for Auburn and then for Bama? No. Yeah. I mean, a fantastic time to start watching. Uh, like I said, last week, I had not watched. Um, I had seen highlights. I had seen snippets of gameplay that that was my entire thing. And was just like, oh, you know, see the they beat this team, or then they lost to this team, right? And as you know, before I watched it, like in my head, I was thinking this is going to be a typical Rick Barnes team that we fall in love with, we think can beat anybody that they play, and then they fall apart eventually, um, and they don't make it to past, you know where we want them to be in this in in March. So it just it felt very much like that before I started watching and was just like, oh, here we go. This is what it's going to be. This is the same old, same old with Tennessee basketball Rick Barnes. I watched this Auburn game versus our former coach. And I love I you know that's when I really started to get into Tennessee basketball was with Bruce and I don't care. I still like to kind of root for him at Auburn and watching him and the way he coaches. And like, it reminds me of those teams, right? Like seeing all of that. Go ahead. I just want to say real quickly. Yeah. Bruce will always be my basketball coach as well. Strictly just for our age. Yeah. For our age. Yeah. The last thing I'll say, and then I'll let you go back watching Bruce and some of the stuff that he called offensively and some of the stuff, how the easy baskets he gets for his players yeah, compared to ours. I'm like, if you're watching this game, this is what tells you Bruce is such a better coach than Rick on, on, on the floor on game day. We, we don't have to talk about building a program or whatever. Cause Rick is a hall of fame coach. He is a very good basketball coach. Yes. But you watch Bruce and it's like, yeah. I'm talking three times in that game in the second half. I'm like, 
he gets his guys a wide open layups, wide open shots. I'm like, dang it, dude. That's why he's so good. Anyways, continue. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm totally with you. He's that's, that's how I see it. So having a game like that where we have a star at Tennessee who absolutely takes over the game and pushes through good coaching, right? Pushes through a pretty well-coached Auburn team, pretty put-together Auburn team. That doesn't seem like it's happened at Tennessee, right? Like, we've had good players, but we've never had a dude, uh, a Hemothy. You know what I mean? We have not had that kind of guy. And Dalton to just be like, listen, I got this. And just take absolutely do whatever he wanted, make every shot. Uh, I, I think like 25 of his points are in the fourth quarter. He, you know, outscored Auburn by himself in the last 12 minutes. He just absolutely went wild, and it was such a cool experience to be like, holy shit, we have a guy like this on our team who can do this? Very shocking, and it set up the Alabama game. It set up what I was expecting and what I wanted to see in the Alabama game. Um, Also, shout out Ziegler. 17 points in that Auburn game, didn't miss a three. I mean, the guy makes plays. He is our number two. Like, I know we were talking about that bef- before. Is like, you know, kind of how these guys stack up. Like, he's number two. I would almost say that Adu has played himself into the number three player on our team because he is a consistent 12 points, uh, eight rebounds, and – now plays his butt off. Um, so we go. Uh, do you want to talk about the Auburn game before we talk Bama? Uh, I'll just ask you this real quick. Did you think we we're going to beat Bama? You know, we talked beforehand, and you, you know, you said I think we'll lose to Bama, and I did kind of have the same feeling of. Damn it, we just won a big game and now we're going away. Now we're going on the road. And it just feels like here's the here's the Tennessee we know, right? We beat a Memphis team and then lose to Vandy the next day. Like it's like that's the that's the Tennessee basketball I've experienced in my lifetime. And you know, in that like beginning of the second half. And end of the end of the first half, and they started like getting on a run, and then they took over, and then they had the lead. I was like, "Here we go again. This is gonna be it. This is like this is a typical typical Tennessee basketball team." Um, but let me let me okay, let me jump in. That's yeah. I go to... ahead. I this is a topic for another time. I know I brought this up when in football. I don't want to say this is another typical Tennessee basketball. I think that's just how we feel as fans, but I truly Mm -hmm. feel like if you went and talked to 25 other schools, they're going to say that's a typical Wisconsin team, or this is a typical Memphis team, or this, like we all, we all feel that we, yeah, we, whether it's basketball, football, whatever the case might be, except for Alabama football under Nick Saban. Um, Well, now, now, They're not a typical Alabama team. <laughs> right. But I'm just saying they were the only ones. Yeah. That, you know, they they didn't really deal with those type of, you know, when you're winning six national championships. But um, I thought Tennessee was going to lose, mm. not, not an indictment to them, but only for the fact of college basketball as a whole this year. It's been wild. And exactly. And how difficult it has been to win on the road. So this was not about Tennessee. This was not about Alabama. It was about one team coming off a big win, going on the road into against another good team in a hostile environment. We murdered them at home. It was the first game I went to this year, and we absolutely routed them. So it's it's all of those things that are building up that it's – I took – now, granted, I took Tennessee catching the four and a half because I thought it was too many points. But – 
I, I, I just, I just said, Hey, and if we lose Reed, it's okay. And I truly felt that way. Like I was not going to be pumped if I watched and see the Bama fans cheer and storm the court, which they practiced. And I didn't get to <laughs> did you those videos. I did see those videos. I know. I know they were testing, testing uh, the, <laughs> the, their protocols. But yeah, exactly. That was funny. That was that was the only reason I picked that. That was the only reason. Not not an indictment on Rick Barnes or this team. It was just yeah. you could see the writing on the wall. Because I think even if they lost that game, they're still probably staying at a two seed. Right, right. So ultimately, listen. Ultimately, it doesn't doesn't matter. But mm-hmm. to talk about the Auburn game first, and we've uh, we talked about it on the last pod about for me in my lifetime, DK Don Connects the best the best at least offensive player, probably player. And that is not taking anything from Grant because you talked about, I would correct you. And you were like, Hey, he's that dude. He's Hemothy. Grant Williams was Hemothy. Grant Williams was a dude too. So don't, yeah, he did what he wanted. Right. So don't, don't knock him just because it looks different, but Grant was a two time SEC basketball player of the year. That's, that's special. It just sure. looks, it just looks different. It looks different. Yeah. And I was, um, I was talking to, um, uh, it was actually on Saturday. Do you remember uh, Cameron, the guy I was telling you about, that was the police officer who listens to us? Mm-hmm. And so I, I got to meet him actually this weekend. Um, his wife or his future wife and his mother-in-law, they were doing, they had a uh, wedding or bridal shower and Megan and her mom was there. And I had dropped off some tables. So I was going on Saturday to help pick them, pick them up. Long story short, I ran into him, got to meet him and Lindsay and Ginger and, um, and Ginger's husband and seven. So it was great talking to them, but he asked me, he's like, do you, do you think we win? And I was like, no, I don't. And he's like, no, I, I, I don't either. Um, but he reminded me, we were standing there talking about Dalton connect. And I was like, you know, we just haven't had that lottery pick future NBA baller stud since I've been. And he was like, well, Tobias was, and I was like, Oh it's yeah. To be. Yeah. Well, well he was right. Cameron was like, Tobias was a, I think a lottery pick. And I was like, yeah, I think you're probably right. Cause I guess lottery pick is top 10 maybe. Is I think so. Right. And so I think he was like seventh or eighth and Tobias Harris was, was, was really good, but I've always mentioned like it was good in like the most unimpressive way, no offense, but he didn't like take a ball and, and, and beat someone off a dribble, hit a 15 footer or then whap a three and then dunk on somebody. He would like, get a couple putbacks and get to the line. And like, it was really, really weird. Cause he couldn't really shoot uh, from the outside. Yeah. A couple and, blocks here and there. Yeah. So he was, he was good, but we've heard five star and we've heard of, you know, triple J we've heard of Scotty hops and um, um, Bobby or um, see Scotty hops triple J, you know, Kenny Chandler. And then who was the Robert Hubs? And so I have been waiting for that Kentucky, Duke, um, you know, UCLA, North Carolina five star that comes in. He's here one year. It looks different. And and we I just haven't had that. And that's mm-hmm. like I said, not taken away from Chris Lofton, from Grant Williams, uh, from all the different greats that we've had in, in my lifetime. And so it was funny that Cameron mentioned Tobias Harris. I was like, yeah, Tobias Harris was a lottery pick, but he wasn't a lottery pick for me in my mind, meaning they drafted him because he had really good potential. The dude was like 18 years old. Yeah. But when I watch Dalton and I see what he does in that Auburn game, I'll remember that Auburn game forever. And there were three times, two times or three times in that game. I'm sitting there watching with my dad and I literally just go like this, or I just like do that face <laughs> in my dad, like, did you see this? Are you seeing this right now? <laughs> yeah, it's when he hit the really, really deep three, Chris Lofton three, and he whapped yep. it. Yep. Then, then when he did the drive to the left off balance kind of side fifteen footer, I'm like, and I was like, no way. And he and he whaps it, and I'm like, and then when they when when he's out at top and they have the mismatch, and he blows right by Buddy and Gams. And that's it. You saw it at all three levels. A deep three that was very clutch and important. Mid-range. A dang Kobe Bryant slash Tracy McGrady slash, re- you know, whatever really good NBA player you want to say that can beat someone off the dribble, hit a 15 footer, and then he drives in and gams, and it was effortless. I was like, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Now, I love big man play. I get fired up. Matter of fact, the only time I really jumped up out of my seat 
for the Texas a and game is when they gave it down low to, to Adu, and he had like a little shimmy and lay, and I'm like, go to work, kid. Same, like, hey, same thing. The only the, the time I jumped out of my seat for the Bama game at the end is when uh, uh, my Shaq got that steal, got into Adu, and Adu went up freaking strong as shit. It was like, mm, and put it in and got fouled so hard. I was like, get up, get up, come on, Adu. Like, that's what I'm talking about. I, I, I love the big man play. I, I love when someone plays down low and can look super good with a move, but then I also love that gritty. So, like, that's why my favorite basketball player of all time, Zach Randolph, for the Memphis Grizzlies. Like, that's so when Tobe does something, when Jonas do something, it just, it literally, like, it gets me juiced as if a corner just came up and made a sick tackle. So, yeah. You know, so I uh, that that's what that's what really gets me going. But I'm watching that, and I ended up I was at Litton's the next day, and there's a gentleman there who is the season ticket holder right next to the Douchels. So Tyler, he's been on here. His uh, his um, in laws are the Douchels. Mm-hmm. They're the tickets that I get to go and sit. Uh, they have great seats. Well, the guy I've got to know the guy next to him because I've gone. And this guy is super, super nice guy. He's probably in his 70s, and he he's season ticket holder. He's like, and I saw him at Linton's the next day, and we just start up a conversation. He's like, that's the best performance I've seen in my 35 or 40 years of watching basketball over at TBA, like the best single person performance. And I'm like, that's pretty impressive, you know, in, in watching that long of basketball. And so, you know, it's just it's just neat. It's neat. I mean, find me, find me a game that – another Tennessee player scored 39. Right. Like that doesn't happen a lot in college basketball in general. And then I don't remember that ever happening. Like you said, Grant Williams was a fantastic player, two-time SEC player of the year. He was also a two-way guy where Dalton necessarily isn't. He is more of an offensive minded guy like uh, Luca, you know, in the, in the NBA. And, that stuff is exciting. That's that. That's just what I had to like. That is way more exciting than some of the defensive, like maybe a steal here, maybe a box out here, whatever. Um, so I think that's why it's kind of like, oh, Dalton, oh my gosh, yeah, it's just different. It's you yeah. can be you can be good, but it's just different than what we've had, and that's yeah. that's what's so cool about it. But. I, I've probably gotten excited more for Grant Williams stuff over my time than I did for DK stuff because Grant would go up and miss a layup but get his own rebound, go back in, mm-hmm. get it high and flex. I'm like, let's go. That's But if the game's on the line, do I want to have to pass it in to Grant or mm-hmm. get it to Grant up top and let him work or do I want DK to do it? Yeah, exactly. That, 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 that's, that's, a, that's a simple – and that's no knock to him because – like I said, Grant's Grant's fantastic or is fantastic and was fantastic for Tennessee, but DK's just different. Taking it then to the Bama game, and you go on the road. We're going back and forth. We get a nice little lead. They come back, which by the way, Bama is not fun to watch because they take a lot of threes, and that makes me nervous because all the threes do. You 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 can you can be winning and beating them, and the next thing you look up and it's like, wait, we're down three now. Like we they get just- hot for five minutes. Yes, and it's just we, it's just a flip. And Tennessee had one of those Pat and Rick Barnes teams where we went like seven or eight minutes without a without a made basket. But the the great thing about that Bama win to be on the road to fight back through adversity and that it was a team win because in March, That's right? In March, hopefully we have a game where DK goes for thirty plus. Then we have another game where everyone plays well and where like you talked about. Triple J's got a ton of rebounds, hit a couple timely threes, plays good defense. Mayshack changes the game. I love nothing more when there's an individual in a sport who changes the game by doing something that that, that is not the main thing of the sport. There's just effort. For, for, for example, basketball, you put the ball in the hoop. Mayshack did everything. Now, he did have a couple clutch. He had a clutch three where then he did the steal. I loved his drive in and and then the dish off to Adu, which you just talked about. But yeah, it's put the ball in the basket and he changed the game by just playing really good defense. He was frustrating those guys. He got a couple fouls called on him, but mm-hmm. he was frustrating those those Bama guys. You could tell it. That energy and Rick kept leaving him in, kept leaving him in, which I was happy about. And so then you got Santi, which seemed like he had like 30 steals. You know, and, and he did have a bad air ball, but then he made came back and made a couple nice threes. He had a really nice 
drive layup. Um, it was just Tobey had some nice plays. Uh, like I said, Adu. So it was just like, and then Ziegler, the guy is probably one of the most clutch players. He uh, really is. The guy he went four for fourteen from three on the day, and I remember like in the game being like, dude, just like don't just just like give it. There's more time on the shot clock. Let's try and set up something. I understand you want to get into a rhythm. I get it. But, like, don't do this with Bama shooting threes on the other end like crazy, and they can flip it on us really quick. And then it comes down to the last few minutes, and he bangs a three. I mean, absolutely just bangs a three in their face. He makes both free throws in their face. And it's like, here's a 70% free throw shooter, but he'll make every single one of them under two minutes. It's yeah. it's it's you wild. Said, you- his you, kind of gameplay. You said four fourteen from three, but you meant four fourteen from the field. I think. Phil, let Phil, me go he, look at it. He didn't. He didn't take fourteen threes in the game. It would have been fourteen shots total. But yeah, he pulled back up. But no, Ziegler is legit. He really, really is one of the most clutch players for any of my teams that I can remember. Whether it is a steal, whether he it, was four of fourteen from three. Wow, I, I'm sorry. He was, he was five of 18 from the field and four of 14 from three. Okay, my apologies. My apologies. So That's wow. where I was like, dude, quit taking these threes. Like, we're going to be okay. Just try and set something up. And if, you know, it's down low, maybe we get a rebound or whatever. Like, sometimes with threes, being a big dude and playing basketball, you know, pick up, rec league, all that stuff, it's like – Guys take threes, and I have no idea where that ball is going to go. Y'all, it's I'm trying to rebound. I'm like, bro, that could hit anywhere on this rim and bounce 15 feet away from me. Yeah, it's just wild. Yeah, I always feel like when I watch basketball, yes, you want the three, yes, you want the more points. It is also so difficult to get an offensive rebound it's, with threes. Oh, it's brutal. It's brutal. brutal. Those are so, those are so, so frustrating. But like I was saying. His clutch gene, like you've already mentioned, at the free throw line, at threes, at like I said, a timely steal. The guy, even when Kennedy Chandler was here and he was the backup, you know, I forget that we went into last year and had that great win against Duke in the Sweet 16, and then we, or to go to the Sweet 16, and then we lose to FAU. Like Ziegler was out at the end of last year, and Meshack did a nice job stepping in at point guard. But that team, it looks a lot different last year with with double Z. Oh, yeah. And so that's what was so cool about these two games, getting the Bama sweep uh, of, of Auburn and then and then Bama, but was sweeping both the teams from Bama, you know, one's at home and you get DK go off and then you go to a hostile environment and get a massive team win. But DK still had his moments towards the end of the game where, where Rick was like, hey, let's get it to him on the low block. He goes in, he rises up, and he bangs a little 10-footer in the guy's eye. And it's it's not guardable. It's, it's, it's not guardable because when he mm-hmm. rises up, and shoots like that, and so that's why that win was so cool. Yeah, and there was some adversity because, you that, know, yeah, that was that was the best part. Is like everyone expected Dalton to just get hot and win the game, like he did versus Auburn. And it was like, hey, he's not doing that. What are we gonna do? And we got down, and it was we were down later in the game, and so it was a really really cool basketball thing, a game to watch. I'll finish with this. I had a buddy text, and he said, I think this March we're setting ourselves up for more heartbreak than we did in 2018 and 2019 mm. and I said not me. And I said, this is not to be negative, but I'm not going into March with any expectations anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm not like, I will not allow, if we were number one seed or number two seed, I'm like, cool, great. And then I'm going to go watch the game. If we yeah. win, I'll be super happy. If we lose, I'll be super bummed, but I'm not going into it. Like I did in 2018, 2019, like, Hey, this is our opportunity. This is our chance to make a deep run. I don't want to think that because that is just setting myself up personally for for heartache. I I want to. I'm going to be bummed if we don't make the elite eight. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm not going to go into it that way because, like I said, in 18 I was very bummed. 19 I was very bummed, and then even when we won the SEC championship in 2001 I guess it or two I mean in 2021 and then we went and we lose to that Michigan team I guess that was two years ago so or three years ago whatever it was like I was still really bummed then and so 
this year it's let's just see what happens. I'm not going to say because D, because we have DK we should go farther. I'm not doing it. I, I I think I think you're good saying that. I I mean we have losses on the year, right? We're about to play the South Carolina team that we lost to before, uh, and you know if if there ever was a year that there's not a a you know bona fide best team it's it's this year uh, anybody can lose anybody can lose i you know we've had a couple of 16 seeds beat one seeds recently this is the craziest year i like in my eyes i'm like hell yeah one seed could lose that I, the other years it was shocking this year i'm like i don't know if they deserve ones like well, they've lost two they've lost bad games um so yeah i'm not getting my hopes up either I I don't want I don't I don't want that hurt. Now, when they're in a sweet 16, am I gonna be rooting my ass off? And then am I, am I gonna be pissed for three days, four days, and they lose that game? Yes. Because I'm a fan. There's nothing I can do about that. Right. But I'm gonna try and help my help my heart a little bit. I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah, that's it is what it is. Now, I will say this. If we make it to the Elite Eight, everything after that is gravy for me. Yeah, I agree. So, if we make it to the Elite Eight, I'm going to be ecstatic, and then I'll be bummed when we lose. But I'll look back on it and be like, hey, you know what? At least we made it to the Elite Eight. It's all right. It's, it's That's all right. It's it's another level. So, anyways, great chat with you. I love being back on here. I know, I know this time of year isn't our – forte like uh, maybe football is but i still enjoy i I enjoy being back i need this so it was good (laughs) yeah it's a little therapeutic too say brother all right man so yeah okay thank you guys so much for watching and listening if you are watching please like and subscribe and hit that notification bell and leave a comment uh absolutely love the comments uh if you're just listening rate and review download re-download Follow us on all those listening platforms you might be using. Also, follow us on social media at Pancakes and Bacon for our main account on Twitter at Pancakes and Bacon underscore RTI on Instagram. Uh, you can find Reed at rbacon26 on Twitter. And then for myself, it's just at Kyler Kerbison on all social media. So check me out there. Uh, but yeah, again, thank you guys so much. You're great fans. Uh, you're the reason this keeps going. So please keep up the support. And uh, as always, go Vols.